Great. Hello, everyone. Um, excited to be here. I've been on several of these talks before. Uh, really happy to be on this side and uh, check the stage for once. Um, thanks to Product Tank and Sylvia for setting this up and getting us this great space. <laughs> um, my name is Ville. I work for, uh, I do product at Coda Payments, which is a fintech startup here in Singapore. We are a payment gateway. We do alternative payment channels, helping online con content providers, uh, game developers, streaming services, whatever, monetize in Southeast Asia, particularly in the markets where traditional online payment methods uh, aren't very widely used. Um, I could talk a lot more about uh, online payments in developing markets, uh, but that's not for today. Um, if that's your interest, uh, catch me after this session and, 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 uh, and we can talk more and switch, uh, switch ideas. Um, today, in this brief uh, time slot, I wanted just to bring up one, uh, one subject that's been coming to mind uh, repeatedly um, uh, in a bunch of different, in a different contexts of, of, uh, of product uh, projects. Um, and it's a lot about how we talk about minimum viable products, MVPs. That kind of term keeps coming up, uh, particularly in like a startup context. Um, we, um, it feels like us people have a bunch of different uh, understandings of what it actually means and what they want to do with it. Um, and I feel that that narrative often has a kind of a, almost a detrimental effect on some of the decisions we take when we, at the early stage when we, when we uh, uh, design and, and plan our, our, uh, our products. So here's a popular definition of an MVP. Um, a version of a new product which allows a team to collect the maximum amount of validated learning about customers with the least effort. Um, and that sounds lovely. Get it out there quickly, get some feedback, learn about your users, learn about your products, uh, make it better. Um, the kind of the pitfall or the problem that sometimes comes up or that I feel sometimes appears uh, is that stakeholders might sometimes interpret it slightly differently, just from a slightly different angle. Um, but it's more about minimizing time to market. Just build enough so that you can actually launch the product um, you know, we want to get it out there. We want to say we launched. It's going to have an impact on our financing. Um, you know, time to market, time to market. Uh, very important. Um, we can always improve it later. And that's usually part of that, of that narrative. Just get it out. You can always change and improve it later. And that's basically the idea of the MVP, right? You put it out there, you get learnings, and, uh, and, and you improve. So I wanted to approach this from... Uh, kind of a, uh, an anecdote um, from a product launch that I was PM for a couple of years ago. I had uh, received a rather high level kind of requirement for a new product. Um, and, you know, somewhere at the end of the email, et cetera, like, we just put together a quick MVP and, you know, we can launch this in, you know, a couple of weeks. Should be fine, right? That's, that, that's okay. Um, so here's the actual picture of me after reading that email. <laughs> Uh, feeling the time constraints, the uh, closing in. Um, this is small devil on your shoulder. We keep saying, time to market, time to market. Uh, don't delay, you need to be quick. Uh, so time for some quick decisions, quick designs. You know, let's, let's, get this thing, uh, let's get this thing out there. So the requirement I got was actually to set up, uh, set up an e-commerce site. Um, this was at Coda, and it wasn't really our core business, which was payment processing. Um, but just for, for context, Coda had set up a bunch of these payment channels, carrier billing, um, bank transfers, that we were offering as a portfolio to, to online content providers. Some, well, we felt that there was also an opportunity for us to uh, retail some voucher, like game voucher code uh, codes, uh, for example, is topping up like a Steam wallet or buying a digital Google Play gift card. Um, people in many of these markets had trouble doing that because these big platforms, they hadn't really launched properly yet. They basically just accepted credit cards, which some of these young gamers had. So they would, 
you know, they might go to a convenience store, buy that, that physical code if it was available, or they might not, just not be able to top up at all. So we figured we can harness all of those payment channels that we now have and we offer to our merchants uh, for ourselves. And we can set up this e-commerce site and we can help customers buy these codes. We can distribute them, uh, them online and, uh, um, and help these, uh, these customers that have trouble, trouble topping up. Um, well, so you can see from the picture, I'm actually super excited. This is my like, yes, yes pose. Uh, <laughs> this was an e-commerce site. Um, I'd done these e-commerce. Uh, I worked for a couple of years actually here with Zalora. Um, so I felt like, yes, we can do this. I can, I can handle this. I, uh, um, there's not going to be a problem setting up an e-commerce site. Piece of cake. So let me just tell you briefly about kind of how that played out. Um, how we almost made a bunch of bad decisions and how we kind of lucked out and maybe did a slightly less bad decision. Um, all in the middle of this, this squeeze, this like MVP rush to, uh, to get, something, get something out there. So how do you create an e-commerce from scratch? What do you do? You have two weeks, you know, be quick, let's do it, let's do this. Um, so there's a pretty established paradigm of what an e-commerce site looks like. You, you look at the big players, um, everyone knows how you sell stuff online. You set up a product catalog, you, uh, you have a product or like a, uh, a cart that you put stuff in. It's like shopping in a supermarket. You take things off the shelf, you put them in your cart, you go to the checkout, you, know, you pull out your loyalty card, you get some loyalty bonuses. Um, whether it's Amazon or Red Mart or Zalora, there's quite a lot of parallels, uh, uh, parallels going on. So there's essentially this like understanding of like a best practice or, or you know, how do you, how do you do e-commerce? Um, this was true for our competition as well, for this new product. Um, you went to the site, so you could almost envision it like being in a supermarket. There was uh, voucher codes like presented as physical cards that you basically just took and you put in your cart and you went to the checkout and you signed up. Uh, they asked you everything from your address, your shoe size. Um, you did your payment and, and you get your, your, uh, your code delivered. Um, so clearly there was a, a very clear blueprint of how to, how to do this. Uh, if Amazon does it like this, it, it must be good. <laughs> they, uh, they know how it's done. We would be very stupid not to do the same. So here's me looking at that requirement. One hour later, I'm already kind of signing up for a trial account at, at Shopify or looking at some other similar services. Um, it should be pretty quick. You know, you just upload some product information, you configure some payment channels, um, and you're and you're ready to go. Success, MVP launched in in a matter of days. Um, and there's always that, we can always change it later. We get this out, we get some feedback, we see what happens. Um, if we ended up going, doing that, I think it would have been much less successful than it ended up being. Uh, so this was kind of, I think, where, where there was a, a lucky break. So the founders of the company had actually played around with this idea before, like a year or two before, and part of that set of documents and ideas that I got, there was also a, a simple wireframe that someone had played around with sometime, sometime earlier. Um, and it was very different. It was like, I was looking at that, it's like, like where's, where's the rest of it? Like, how is, the, how is this supposed to work? Um, it, was, it was a one-page affair. Um, no account, no shopping cart. Um, like, God, there, there wasn't even like a separate checkout page. It didn't, it didn't look, it didn't feel like an, like an e-commerce site the way I would have directly envisioned it. Um, it was all just bundled into one. But this did, when we looked at it and then was like, hmm, you know, comparing these two, I don't know, almost e-commerce paradigms, like you have this, sh should our shop actually feel like being in a supermarket? being, you know, checking out different products, comparing them, putting into your shopping cart. Um, so after playing around and after a lot of discussion, um, 
we ended up kind of starting to design based on that simple mock-up that, that had initially been done. And instead of that supermarket, we ended up with a purchasing experience that is, does have a parallel in the real world as well, uh, but it's definitely not a supermarket, it's, it's, it's a vending machine. You walk up to it, you, you, know, you punch in a number, you push a button, you put in a, a, you know, a coin, uh, and an order is processed, you get your, you get your thing. Um, a completely different experience, both, both offline and, and kind of as an offline, offline experience. So, and that's actually what we went with, that design. Um, and in that, we basically ignored all of the conventional knowledge, like the best practices of, of e-commerce. There was nothing there about, uh, you know, multi-step checkouts or, uh, you know, how to optimize shopping carts. Uh, so in, this was basically what you might have seen in the initial title that was on the, on the meetup call. It was something about taking the wrong turn. And this, at the time when, I, when we were working, I was like, like, this kind of feels a bit wrong <laughs> because there's so much knowledge about how you're supposed to do this, how this is supposed to feel as a customer. Everyone's expecting these certain elements and we don't, we don't have any of that. Like, is, is this... Is this going to work out? Are we, are, we completely, uh, are we completely wrong? It's not that the MVP that we ended up building and, and, and putting out wasn't, didn't, you know, didn't have issues. Of course it did. But we did then learn based on, based on that MVP. We learned specifically about how customers would interact with, with this kind of vending machine purchasing process, which was significantly different from uh, from interacting with a basic basic website. So the point I'm kind of trying to make uh, is that those early product decisions um, regarding like the uh, the design, the UX, it will put you down a, a certain path. If you if we if you put up a standard e-commerce site, you're going to get learnings that are very much related to that e-commerce site. Instead, if you put up something different, <laughs> you're gonna get learnings about specifically that UX and, 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 and the way customers interact with, with that product. Um, and even though, I mean, this, this mantra is you can always change it later, um, you can, but if all your learnings or your inputs, you're looking at this product that you built, you're looking at the feedback you're collecting, uh, it's all gonna be tied to some of those decisions that you made, that you made early on. So there's that like, sliver of time when we make very long-reaching decisions about our products early on. Um, we might not always realize or give them like, due concern because of that MVP narrative, like time to market, get it out there, uh, do it quick, just learn, you can always change it later. Um, When we say we always change it later, it's kind of like we're cheating ourselves a bit. Um, we, we can change it, but w will we really have the input and the, the, the learnings required that, we actually, that will actually push us to also try those other paths? The MVPs are supposed to be about learning, um, but like if you don't have an abundance of resources, the time and the effort that you put in, the mindset that you build with those early decisions, they're going to be really hard to deviate from. Um, you're going to need to get a really, really bad feedback or really bad experiences uh, from customers trying out your product or even just trying out a prototype to make kind of a really drastic switch. It's much closer at hand to just do those kind of small improvements, uh, try different things, you reorganize stuff, but for that main core, like UX, you, you might kind of be, you might be stuck, both, uh, both mentally, but also kind of resource-wise. If you have to go back up to a decision maker and say, I mean, this, this is okay, but I think we should basically rebuild it. Can we, can we do another project? Can I have another budget? <laughs> and uh, you're gonna have to have a really strong argument uh, if you want that to, to go through.
So if that early small wireframe wouldn't have existed, uh, we would probably be still on a path of building like a supermarket e-commerce for selling those codes. Um, it likely would have performed okay, but we, we wouldn't have been much different from our competitors. Um, we would have had kind of the same problems, the same customer frustrations for making, you know, essentially very simple purchases, um, but having to go through that whole heavy supermarket experience to, uh, uh, to do it. So just looking back, it feels like that was, there was this important fork in the road, uh, which I wouldn't, I, which we didn't realize at the time. It didn't really put enough attention or uh, weight on those decisions that we were make, making early on. Um, that said, I'm not saying you need to overthink early decisions either, but you need to make them consciously about the fact that they're going to have very long-reaching uh, implications. Um, it's much easier to take another day or two in that early phase to gather some more data, get, get some more input, than to change your mindset even just a few months uh, down the road. So try not to lock yourself in uh, uh, too early just based on too hasty resources. Just because someone is, is you know, yelling MVP, MVP, <laughs> time to market, time to market. Um, There's probably material in, in for another three or four talks just in the frameworks and processes and stuff that you can use to improve those des decision-making uh, steps early on. Um, someone else is, is probably much better equipped to, to talking about that. Um, but maybe, uh, I don't know, do you agree? Do you, have you had similar experiences? Do you see when you're looking back, do you see these forks in the road um, where you might have been persuaded to, uh, to go forward maybe a bit too quickly, maybe a bit convinced that it was just temporary, that it was just for the MVP, just to be quick, be first to market and being able to change it, change it later? We are at the fork in the road. <laughs> so... Uh uh, I think my friend is with me at work with her. Um, yeah, as of now, I think, well, what's our decision? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we just decided, like, let, let's come down on our stuff to just make it work. Like, is that like, like what you said? Yeah. We'll deal with the repercussions later. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I've, I mean, this comes from a very uh, kind of startup context. Um, bigger companies, established companies, they're going to have more established processes and, and, and steps that we happen. Are at, we are from a big company. Right, that happen, <laughs> happen at this point. But uh, it feels like these experiences can, can come on, on, on any level. Anything from, from very even just small product updates, feature updates, to launching completely new products to uh, maybe even on a bigger, uh, a bigger scale. Um, anyone else want to weigh in, uh, looking back, where are those forks, uh, have, you had, have you had any similar, similar experiences? Or any general questions at all as well? Yeah, I have more of a question. Um, so this seems to have happened kind of by circumstance. It wasn't necessarily a conscious decision to go to kind of rethink the MVP. Um, but what about, so let's assume we buy your thesis here, and our manager is telling us to ship it to an MVP, um, and you don't actually have any data to say, well, I have a really compelling argument why maybe we should try something radical. Um, what do you think would be a good strategy to, to say? To convince the manager? To push back. To push back. Um, well, I mean, when you say you don't have any data to, to support that, 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 uh, that argument or, or that suggestion, that is a bit of a problem. You should, whether it's really hard data or whether it's, you know, observations that you can 
at least somehow validate, you know, ask a couple of presential customers. Uh, there's a bunch of ways the, you know, you can collect data on an idea just within hours or within days. You don't need to invest, you know, weeks at a time. So even that weak evidence, uh, I think is going to go a long way. Of course, the more data, the better. Um, and I think just looking at like the circumstances, for us, I mean, when, when we ended up, um, we evaluated both of those ideas. Uh, we had really good discussions about, you know, who are we actually serving? What type of, of, of customers are we, are we looking at? Um, these are like, um, when, you, when you go to a convenience store to buy one of these codes, what's the, what's the customer experience like? Um, you know, there's a rack of things, you know, at the 7-Eleven, you go there and you pull a code and you queue up and you go to the counter. Um, but there's also actually those vending machines where you can do the same. Um, and given the choice, you know, if you're a, uh, a young guy who wants to top up his, his, his gaming account, or any, any, any young person, you would, you know, do you want to go walk around in the store and, 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 and you know, touch the codes and compare, you know, two identical cards to each other? No, it doesn't, it doesn't help you at all. Um, the simpler, the better. If you can, you know, instead of queuing up to the counter and interacting and, you know, payment and, and, and uh, you know, loyalty cards, whatever, if you can instead just punch in on the, uh, on the vending machine what you want, it feels like it's, uh, we, uh, we thought that was much, a much more compelling, uh, compelling experience to these like impatient guys who, who are, they're just going to buy one code. It's not like they're going to put a bunch of codes in the cart. They're just, they know what they want, they get it, and, and, and the quicker the better. For your question, any data is better than no data, right? <laughs> um, I was looking at Tommy. And Grant, you only had two weeks, and you mentioned you had two weeks. Right, that, that was, well, that was the initial, like, so, you know, we can probably, you should be able to do this in two weeks, right? I think yeah. we ended up doing it in, like, five weeks, and, and that was still considered. You were like, wow, basically, based on a best known practice that you were going to kind of mimic up from Amazon the rest. Yeah. So had you not had, this potential MVP sitting in the uh, bottom corner uh, yeah. office drawer, you know, that you could pull out and, and work off. Would you not have gone through micro MVPs upon every uh, design iteration? So you, you're pulling out multiple MVPs that at some point you have to validate which direction yields some form of uh, more positive direction, right. more positive right. results. So you have micro MVPs that you're busy iterating upon each time, um, and the closest one to that to that goal, or, or, or to yield that objective, or, or to generate that objective, should be close to the direction you should be choosing. Right? Yeah, that, that's what the intuition says. Yeah, right. Um, kind of what I given the time, or well, given that you would have a little bit of extra time to first of all try and prove something. Yeah. So what it feels like. To me, looking back, and also from experience from some some like projects after that, is that once you've once you've chosen made some of those core decisions, it'll be even though you create multiple iterations or you know put in the time to try to uh, make variations, you, it's a risk that you're still your mindset is kind of stuck a bit on some of those decisions you made. It might be difficult to step back and say, okay, why don't we try something completely different? You might be looking at, okay, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll still have the shopping cart here and we'll just kind of move it around a bit or we switch the, like the, uh, we make the catalog page different. Um, but it feels like some of, yeah. If you had the time, you would have probably looked at it differently in, uh, in hindsight so it was an exact science. So if you had the time, you may have looked at a different path to explore a different solution for the customer at hand. Um, 
I can also only say I, I would hope I would have done it. I, yeah, I don't. Exactly. I don't have the confidence that I would. Yeah, I, I always look back and think, oh, yeah, I, I should have looked at all of these different options. But I'm, I'm really worried that I, I wouldn't have. I'm, I'm <coughs> kind of convinced that two years later I would have still, you know, gone down that path and tried a bunch of different options and, and looked at different ways of doing it, but still had that kind of very underlying blueprint uh, to work with. So do you have the uh, final result? It's pretty close to what, well, I think it might actually be, be here. Uh, yeah, these should be production, production stuff. So you're basically just on one page, I want a Google Play gift card. I want the DNOM to be 20,000 rupiah, 200,000 rupiah. I select a payment channel. It's basically just a buy button at the, at the end. Then depending on what you want to pay with, uh, that's where the Coda Pay service comes in. Well, if you're paying with your mobile account, it will show a simple window where you input your phone number and authenticate. Um, and then you come back to the shop and, and the code is right there. So it's, it's rather close to that vending machine parallel. You, you punch, you know, you select the product, you say here, well, you need to select the payment method, it's just, just cash, you have to, uh, to actually make a choice, but it's still just one or two pushes off the button on the same, basically, page or machine, if you would. Great. Um, I guess I, I'd say uh, thank you at this point. Um, if you want to talk about this further or uh, talk about payments or whatever, just catch me after, uh, after the other talk and the interactive part. Thank you. Thanks.